I'm going to start with how many of you um, were at the final presentation in 2019 when I concluded the, the survey for Fitchburg? Show of hands. Oh, good. No, that's good. <laughs> I, I was afraid that I was going to be uh, you know, showing you a lot of the same things that you've seen before. Um, but it's really not all that bad to reiterate a lot of these things because even though um, you know, I did the survey, I identified things that were significant, a lot sometimes those reports get put on a desk or put on a shelf and they get forgotten about. So maybe this will, I guess, maybe light a fire under some people if, if anyone's interested in pursuing um, some further research efforts on some of these things. So um, I didn't realize there was another line to the, to the uh, what I'm supposedly talking to you about. Uh, <clears throat> I believe it's historical places. So I apologize for forgetting that. I just got the byline part. Um, and I just threw up some pictures. Basically, um, you know, this, this is where Fitchburg is. Um, this is what it was. And on the right is where it, where it is today. That is not to say that everything historic is gone. Um, but, but there's certainly been a lot of new construction of late. Um, and I haven't actually been here. I came back a couple weeks ago um, just to kind of do a little drive around uh, just to see what's here, what's not, what's new. And I was really, I was like, oh, I don't remember that. Oh, I don't remember that. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of change, uh, obviously, with the growth of the community. So I am just basically going to, hopefully that works, good, uh, just an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, that may seem like a lot. Um, it's not too terribly long. If I see anyone losing it, I'll speed it up. Um, I will basically do a little review of the 2019 survey findings first. And then I will touch briefly upon resources that I know aren't here anymore that I surveyed in 2019. And then information that I found since 2019 about some of the properties here in Fitchburg. Um, I have a weird, I wouldn't call it a photographic memory, but I have a pretty good memory that if I see something that I've seen in the past and there's historical information on it that I didn't know before, I can usually track back to which community I saw it in. And I do have two instances of kind of some fun information that I found out after the fact. Um, at least I think it's fun. Um, and then I will conclude with how you can look up properties on the state database. Um, some of you may already know how to do that. Uh, but I'm just going to walk you through how to be able to do that. And you can look for things in Fitchburg, or if you have interests anywhere else in the state, you can just poke around and, and use it. Um, the other thing that um, that is good for is if you are poking around and you see some information that isn't correct, what? That means I did something wrong. It's entirely possible. Um, you can actually contact the Historical Society directly and give them information to correct what's on there, as long as you can absolutely prove why you're right. And I might have been wrong. So, <laughs> um, and actually, I'm going to give you an example of something I was wrong on. So, um, and that I'll wait for that at the end. And then we'll just have a brief question and answer. So, um, that was way longer than I wanted to to be on just that. Um, a lot of these pictures or pictures that I have up here are just kind of random because nobody wants to look at a plain screen. So, <laughs> um, so here we go. We're going to start with the 2019 findings. So to start off, um, there are about 120 properties that were previously surveyed in Fitchburg before I even came. They were in the, the state database. Um, most of those photos were taken in like 1977, 1982. So they are black and white images, as you can see up <coughs> as examples there. So the start of the project was September 2018. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, 
you, ha you already had five properties that are listed in the National Register, as you can see the, the photos of them below. Um, some of you may have read the survey and thought, why aren't the National Register properties discussed in here? Because they're already listed in short. Um, ultimately, the reason I did the survey was to determine what else is out there that is potentially National Register eligible. So I'm not ignoring your National Register properties. There is a list in, in the survey. Um, and I think um, the, the survey is actually posted on the city's website, so it's easily accessible. Um, one property was officially determined eligible previously uh, due to a Department of uh, Transportation road project, um, the Pr Pr Pritchard McManus, McManus Pritchard. I'm getting it mixed up. McManus Pritchard, Farmstead. Um, so that was previously determined eligible, and what that means is it is potentially eligible for the National Register, which means if it hadn't changed when I looked at it, it was still eligible for the National Register. So that was another one that I really didn't have to do much other than take a look at it <coughs> and make sure that everything was still intact on the property. <coughs> so, um, and at the conclusion of, and I apologize, <coughs> I don't know where my voice is going. <coughs> um, I surveyed approximately 200 new properties, um, which is pretty, is pretty good for, for a community. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, just throwing up a, just a few examples of, of the new properties that I surveyed. Um, so in order to be eligible for the National Register, it has to be eligible under one of four criteria. It either has to have significance in history, significance to a specific person, which is criterion B. Criterion C is architecture, so either it's a good example of a specific property type, say a schoolhouse, a church, a gas station. Um, or it has to have uh, a high architectural style to it. Um, criterion D, archaeology, that has to do entirely with things underground, which I am not an archaeologist, so I did not find anything eligible. I, I wasn't digging in anybody's yards. Uh, so, um, but that is the fourth criteria for eligibility for the register. And then overall, um, for me to go out and survey it, it needs to have a degree of integrity. This is not located in Fitchburg. <laughs> um, but ultimately, this is an example of a house that would not be surveyed because it's missing its windows, the porch is half gone. Um, it, the integrity of the building is just not there. Um, you just can't make an evaluation on a property that has lost that much of its original fabric. So. Now, finally, to the results. Um, so I did identify three historic districts, potentially, and then 12 individual properties I discussed. Um, let's see. Sorry. I, um, I'm sure I'm skipping over stuff. This is why I make notes, and then I tend to not, not to read them. Um, OK, so the, yeah, the key word here is recommendations. So yes, I've been doing this a long time, and I pretty much know what is potentially eligible and what is not. But they don't just let me go off by myself. I actually have to have city, um, state historical society staff with me uh, to verify th their eligibility. So it's not just me saying it's eligible. It's somebody from the Wisconsin Historical Society as well. And, and even though we think think something is potentially eligible based on the research that I did, um, there are always instances, um, thankfully not too many, um, where when somebody maybe locally or myself does a little bit more research and I find out, ooh, uh, that wasn't quite right. So um, 
so again, the key word here is their, their recommendations. So these ultimately are what rose to the top after doing research and looking at um, everything in the community because I drove up and down every single public road. And I will you know, um, emphasize the word public because again, there are a number of driveways that are very long here. And ultimately, I did not drive down them because as you know, um, things have kind of changed. I mean, I know there are people that don't want people coming on their property regardless, but times have changed. Um, I can't just go driving down a driveway anymore and knocking on a door and saying, can I take a picture of your house? It, those, those days are gone, unfortunately. Um, so, so I will say that there are some, some properties that I wasn't able to, to inventory um, just because of that fact. So, um, so I'm going to start with the three districts. Um, if this seems like they're taking long, they take a little longer to explain. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about why they are eligible. Um, because they're, they're, they're full of multiple components and they'll take a little longer. So not all of the things I'm going to be talking about are going to take as long as these districts. So, um, and again, I'm probably telling you a lot of things that you already know, um, but again, I'm putting into the context of why does that make this property eligible for the National Register. Um, so the, the fish hatchery dates back to 1876, um, but the earliest buildings or features that um, are on the grounds to date, um, the earliest dates to circa 1939, um, and they're all located east of the Lower Drive. Um, the hatchery is the oldest of all of the DNR operated hatcheries in the state. And although the buildings have changed over its 140 year history, um, they have evolved along with the evolution of fish, fish raising. Um, and again, the, the hatchery's function uh, remains the same, to produce and distribute fish for recreational and conservation purposes. And as a result of that, that is why this property is considered eligible under Criterion A for its history and its association with recreation and conservation. And that would not only be on a local level, but it would also be on a statewide level um, since the hatcheries are, are located throughout the state. And, and then here's another, while I don't typically deal with Criterion D, because I'm not an archeologist, um, this property actually may also offer some Criterion D potential eligibility um, because, um, some of the, oh, I'm, why can't I think of the word? Um, anyway, we know for a fact that they just covered up some stuff <laughs> that's original uh, to the property. Sorry for uh, dumbing that down, so I'm just spacing on the word. Um, so, so there is stuff underground uh, of some significance. And do know, if you see some photos that look familiar to you from your the Fitchburg Historical website, yes, I ripped them off of your website. Uh, <laughs> so, and then here, here's, um, we have to draw a boundary around districts so we can show exactly the extent of the property and then identify each of the buildings. Um, so the next one, I'm sure, I heard some go, hmm, yeah. <laughs> when, when things start to date from the 50s and 60s and 70s, people start getting a little like, really? Are you kidding me? But yeah, um, you know, we're in, we're in 2023. So <laughs> anything 1973 uh, or before is, is now considered, you know, you can consider it because it is 50 years old and that's the threshold for National Register eligibility. So. I would imagine the vast, well, maybe I shouldn't say the vast majority of you, but a lot of you know these only as regular rental apartments, and that is all. Um, so the property consists of about 10 acres and includes 13 buildings, all of which were built in 1962, and they were designed by the Madison architectural firm of Weiler and Strang. Um, so the complex was actually modeled after Scandinavian co-ops and 
the gardens is understood to be the first cooperative housing project in the United States um, that was built primarily for the elderly. Um, although the project ultimately failed, um, since the project's four sponsors were unable to sell 90% of the units within the two-year two um, required timeline, they did revert to regular apartment rentals, which is what they are today. Um, however, the fact that it was planned as the co-op, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, basically, it's, it's eligible for its association with a national movement, um, specifically associated with Section 213 of the National Housing Act of the Federal Housing Administration, um, which allowed for housing cooperatives. So it's a very, it's a very niche area of eligibility, um, and one that, that this Assuming that it really was the first one in the United States, um, you know, that's, that's fairly, fairly significant. Um, and again, here we just have um, the map of the boundary that shows the location of all the buildings. So if that one made you go, huh, <laughs> this one <laughs> is probably gonna make, yep. Can I, can I make a comment about the Chalet Gardens property? Yeah. And maybe there's others in here that know. I think actually that property had been, Catherine, maybe you can help me on this too. Uh, prior, that property had been the university elect, what was called the electric farm property. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's others in here remember that as well. It had been part of the university research, electric research farm. So I mean, I don't know if that would qualify for your um, D category. I mean. It, it could if there's something there, you know, f from that period I mean, go, that would. Going way back, I mean, the property was vacated and these structures were built there, but I think that was yeah. part of the university property. Okay, okay. Yeah, ultimately, um, it's, I think that would be a very hard case to make, because um, that would be another complete different area of eligibility. Yeah. And then obviously, you've got all these buildings on it now. Um, so I guess I would probably say probably not. It might be a little nugget of history that could be put into yeah. the story, sure. certainly. Um, but as far as its eligibility, um, they don't go together. I guess yeah. is I didn't I don't recall reading that but that yeah. but again I think my, my concern started with when it was being built so um, so does anybody live in hey <laughs> all right excellent oh so that means you actually got a letter that okay very good yeah so parade of homes um, so these are even, they're, they're, they're younger than I am, um, <laughs> whatever that's worth. Um, so, you know, technically they're not yet 50 years old. Uh, again, as I said, the general threshold for eligibility is 50 years. Um, but the district could potentially be eligible uh, when it does come of age in 2036. Um, but that would, that would assume that major alterations don't occur to a large number of the homes. Um, you know, if it's a changed window here or there, or, you know, slightly different porch, not the worst thing. But when you start, like, adding things up, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a um, new porch, new windows, and you've got new siding, well, now, now your property is, is, would be considered non-contributing because it has changed enough that it just doesn't look like it did originally. So, um, so this district is, and I know I'm talking to people who live here, so <laughs> um, obviously it's district, uh, district centered around Schumann Drive and Osmondson Road, and forgive me, I'm probably gonna wreck some names as I go along. Um, I knew them when I was here four years ago, and now I don't remember them all. Um, 
but it consists of 35 homes, uh, 30 of which were included in the Madison Parade of Homes between 1981 and 1983. So this is actually fairly rare um, that they're this close together uh, from three years of, of parade homes. Um, th this was a, a fun one to, to research, um, although kind of a pain in the butt too. Um, but thankfully, the, the Realtors Association, um, or the Builders Association, I'm sorry, um, was great and they, they had all their materials and basically let me copy whatever it is I needed. So um, at first, the reason I had initially found this is I was doing some newspaper, newspaper research and then you know, you throw in the address and one pops up as a parade of homes and then another one and then another one and like, hmm, I think we might have something here. So, and again, if you live here, you know these things or if you've lived here this long, but you gotta remember I'm coming from somewhere else um, and just trying to fully immerse myself in all that is Fitchburg um, <laughs> in, a, in a year, so. Um, as you can see, I also, on this map, included um, Parade of Homes from 1980 and 1984. So while they're still kind of in the same area, they're just a little too far away to be able to make a, a larger historic district. And then also, um, I did also identify that in, is it, I think, 1989 and 1990, there was another batch of them as well. So that's identified in the survey um, for someone in the future <laughs> to take a look at, because that was just a little too far out for me to include in here. We're typically supposed to just look at about f um, any 40 years or so. Um, so that would have put it in the 50 and is just beyond. Was it the, I can't remember the letter was sent, was it because of the year or was it because of the uniqueness of the lots and the, and the woods that it's in or what was the reason for you? Oh, why, why it's eligible? Yeah. Uh, just simply by the fact that it, it's Parade of Homes Homes. <laughs> um, like I said, it is very atypical for them to be that clustered together over a period of a couple of years. Yeah. Um, so again, as long as they retain their original, close to original appearance, you know, this thing could well be um, eligible in 2036, which seems like a really long time, but it's really probably not. <laughs> so, like I said, districts take a little longer to discuss. Um, so now I'm gonna go through the 12 individual properties and if I, again, if I butcher anybody's name, give me a holler. I'm happy to, to, to take it. <laughs> um, and let's see. So here we have the, the Roman farmstead. <laughs> um, when I was taking photos for this, and I forgot his name, but anyway, um, he was there, uh, the Roman owner and uh, it was just it was just wonderful to be able to talk to him and for him to be able to tell me everything you don't get that lucky to have um, a farm being in a family that long and for them to know that much information about it usually you're just kind of guesstimating on years you're guesstimating on history and uh, he was just um, he was just great great help so um, they came to Fitchburg the the brothers came in the late 1830s and they first built a log cabin on the site, which is no longer extant. Um, however, by the 1850s, a portion of the existing house uh, was built and it, was, it looks like it was completed between 1863 and 1864, um, also based on the conversation with him as well. Um, and despite the Romans being early settlers, um, I had initially thought, okay, we can, it might be potentially eligible under criterion A for settlement because they were early settlers. Um, but because the log cabin is no longer extant, um, I couldn't look at 
at settlement for eligibility. But within, I want to say, about the last 15 years, there's a new component of Criterion C where if you have a really good farmstead layout and you have a lot of most of the major um, farm outbuildings on it, you can be eligible simply um, for farmstead layout, providing the house is recognizable and the barn is recognizable. Even though the barn was built later, um, it, it, it's, still, it's still old enough. Um, so anyway, it, that one's eligible for farmstead layout. Question on no. the barn. Oh, yep. Um, there was an <laughs> earlier barn that yep. was there. Correct. Do you know if this later barn was built on the site, same site as the earlier barn? Yes, it was. Um, I don't know that it was the same site. I can't remember. No, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't commit everything to memory from when I did this before. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it was, on, it was at the same location. Okay. I asked George Roman that one time, and I got an answer that I couldn't understand. Oh, OK. Well, I, I do believe it was, a, from what I remember him telling me, um, that it was at the same location. All right. Um, and then here we have the um, UW-Madison Stu Student Observatory um, and the Oscar Mayer Observatory, which was built in 1879, 1880 originally. But as you all know, it was moved here in 1960. Um, so some of you may be aware that moved buildings are typically not eligible for the National Register. Uh, one of the caveats to that is if a property is eligible for its architectural style or architectural form, or in this case as a resource type or property type, it can be eligible even though it has been moved. Um, so as most of you are likely aware, the observatory was built for use by UW students rather than being built for faculty research. Um, while that does make it unique, it is not eligible for the significance of that historic use due to the fact that it was moved. So, um, and I already told you that. Okay, and in this case, um, the observatory stands as a very good example of a property type uh, that is somewhat rare throughout the state, um, especially regarding <laughs> pre-1900 examples. It is actually one of only three in the state that are pre-1900. The other two are Washburn and Yerkes. So. The Bitney Dick Farmhouse, uh, built about 1890, potentially eligible, and now these are going to go a little faster, uh, ultimately um, eligible as a good example of the Queen Anne style of architecture, um, the best one in Fitchburg. Um, so that is potentially eligible under C. Do you know where that is? It's on Lacey Road. Uh, just past the roundabout. Is that a first roundabout, second round? Wait, I don't know. I'm probably wrong direction. That way. <laughs> I had to look out the window and orient. That's Sam Cook. No. Joe Reed. Joe Reed. Oh, yeah, sure. Joe Reed's house. Oh, they, well, they, they sold it both. Okay. The uh, characteristic Queen Anne view is away from Lacey Road, so it's not easily visible. It faces south. <coughs> Okay, all right. Next up, um, the Dr. John M. and Marion Opitz house. Um, so <laughs> I identify it by that as they were the actual second owners of the house. They did not actually build it. It was built in 1952 by the Christensens. Um, however, I couldn't find any significance um, under criterion B for the Christensen's. Um, I love this house. I don't, there's always a house or a building in every community that I'm like, oh, I really like this one. <laughs> and I'm like, 
I feel like I should be able to make this potentially eligible. Because <laughs> um, normally, I don't look into the second owners that closely. Um, because usually, significance is the first owner. Um, but that does not preclude a second owner from being significant. And in this case, he was. Oh, yep. What about a third? A third? Yeah, a, a third also can be. It just needs to be within, you know, the, it needs to be 50 years out from, so 2023. Yeah, like I said, 1973, the significance would have had to have occurred pre-1973. And then also, they tend to like it if there's at least a little cushion there, too, pre that. So this one pushes it, obviously. It started, um, the Opitzes um, were here from 64 to 78. Um, but um, let's see. So Dr. Opitz resided in the house. Yeah, I already told you that. Um, his contributions to the field of medical genetics was in the 1960s later described as landmark work, and he is considered a pioneer in the field of clinical genetics. So, um, you know, unless you're a, a science fiend, um, that's the stuff that, you know, you, you just, I'm sure you didn't talk about that over coffee. Okay, so let's anywhere. talk about that example. So yeah. you, just how you found that, you like that house and then, coincidentally it happened to be a famous guy that owned it or how did you get tipped off to that house um, well I took a picture of it because of the field stone construction so first <laughs> it's I still I still would have surveyed it okay. um, but unless Bob Smith right. did something significant I probably wouldn't have found it potentially eligible for the National Register. So you looked at the house first, then you found out that he was a famous person that owned it. Correct, and, and that's really the only way I can do it being from out of town. Okay. You know, I, I start with the resources and then I do the research. So, um, and where is this one located? Irish Lane. Yeah, Irish, Irish Lane, oh, okay. Lane, right? So I apologize that I don't have the addresses on here because I, I made the apparently wrongful assumption that not everybody knows where everything is. So I, I, I apologize for that. So, um, and then when I wrote this up in the report in 2019, I actually just called it the Dr. John M. Opitz house. And it wasn't that I was trying to blow off Marion. <laughs> It's that because the significance for the house had to do with him and his work. However, since then, the National Register has decided that even though the significance is associated only with one of the spouses, they still want the house to be named for both of them, which I think is the right way to do it. Yay, but, you know. <laughs> It takes, it takes them a while to get, come around to things, but um, anyway, so, so there's that one. So where I come from, that's Boise. But from, I think what I recall from the last time, it's Boyce around these parts. First name, anyone know it, uh, know it for sure? Okay, well then we'll just go with Mr. Tots, <laughs> um, his home and studio in 1967. Um, he was an artist. The house is not eligible um, as far as his work as an artist. That doesn't mean it couldn't be, but I didn't find enough about his work to, to be able to determine that it was eligible under, in that regard. Um, but as far as Criterion C architecture, it's a really great example of 1960s contemporary architecture. Is that Franklin Wright? It is not. Actually, okay. he designed it. So, and it took, he started it in 64 and didn't finish it until 67. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a while. Uh, what neighborhood is that in? What, where is that? That is at the end of, oh, 
shoot. Whalen. Thank you. Yes, at the end of Whalen. Whalen and Kane. Kane. Okay. Thank you. See? Sorry. <laughs> Four years ago, I would have been able to auto recall that, so I apologize. I could drive there from here. The, the <laughs> um, so, Fabritech. Um, this, as of 2019, was potentially eligible for as a really great example of 1960s contemporary uh, commercial um, architecture. However, as of last year, those are my pictures from a couple weeks ago, um, I was alerted to the fact that uh, they had gutted it last summer. And so that's what you have on the bottom right. And then they obviously are putting an addition there. And I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of window alterations. Um, anyway, moral of the story is this is this is an unfortunate one. This one is no longer eligible. Um, so my understanding is that the people, company, I don't know, um, that purchased it had no idea that it was um, potentially eligible. And that is not to say they probably might not have done what they were going to do anyway. Um, but from my understanding is they did not know um, so actually what happened is they pulled a permit which triggered a section 106 review and, and they had to stop briefly. Um, but at that point it was already, um, gutted. Um, my understanding is it had built in furniture on the inside, um, a fair amount of interesting features, but they are there no more. Has anybody ever been in? No. no, I had a question. Yes. What kind of company was Fabritech? What did they do? Sure, the one that I didn't write down because nobody's going to ask me that. <laughs> I don't remember. But I have it right here if you want to look at it afterwards. <laughs> so. Here we are, again, like 1970s. You're like, oh no, I may have seen this one go up, right? Some of you? <laughs> um, but again, another really, this is a really great example of 1970s architecture. Um, you know, looks fairly intact. Um, I did see that it did just sell last year, so I did take a look at the interior photos. It looks like the interior has obviously been modernized. Um, but it does have a, uh, a central fireplace, which would be very typical of, of 70s, the, the open living room concept. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, nice looking 70s house. Do you know where that one is? Gold, gold Drive. That one I knew, <laughs> like Gold Drive. <laughs> uh, he was a developer and builder so this was his house, but not for very long, if I recall correctly. Um, so here we have a, a sculpture. Um, sculptures are not always eligible for the National Register either. Um, so this one is technically one year short of, of being 50 years old. Um, but it is very unique, and it was it was sculpted by Harry Whitehorse, mm -hmm. who um, was a Native American of Winnebago tribe, and I, I just recently had some conversations with the historical society about this one. Um, I did put in the report that there would need to be a little bit more research done on this property, just as far as. Um, white horses work throughout his lifetime. Basically, you have to try and put it into, you know, where does this fit into his lifetime works and, and then determine, you know, are there other examples similar to it uh, in order to come to a conclusion as far as potential eligibility. So this one is, 
the historical society said that if if there were to be um, a nomination that would want to be pursued on this one, there would have to be a little bit more digging to determine uh, what the the direct route to eligibility would be for it. So that would have been because of its connection to a person. Is that the criteria that that, would, or what would the criterion be? Um, Either it's going to be because of its artistic character under C, or it could potentially be B uh, for the artist himself, Harry Whitehorse. And then Memorial United Church of Christ. Um, again, another one not yet 50 years of age, and obviously due to some additions, it even puts it further out than that. Um, but basically, this is a very unique uh, church and designed by a very you know, significant architect in the state, Helmut Iango. So um, not yet there, but, but on the list to keep, a, to keep your eye on. All right, so the final three are more information is needed. So again, to reiterate, you know, I come in, I fully immerse myself in all that is Fitchburg, um, but I can't learn everything in a year. Um, I like to think I do sometimes, but I can't all the time. Um, so there's clearly a fair amount of research that has been done on this property. But when you put it up to the criteria for eligibility for the National Register. Um, it's not going to be architecture because it is actually two very distinct architectural styles. Um, so that doesn't make the cut. Um, Mr. Knott uh, was a postmaster, if I recall correctly. And what else was he? Well, in, in an early merchant in town, um, but I didn't, I couldn't find anything specific that tied his, what he did uh, for, to make, to, for the significance to rise enough to be eligible for the National Register. Um, however, this is another instance of the second owner. <laughs> Um, and I apologize, my last page must still be sitting on my uh, printer. Um, so I had to quick hand, hand write some stuff from memory here. So, so basically the second owner, uh, Garrett Berry and his son George, uh, were very significant in the early development of the horse industry in Wisconsin. Um, so there is some potential eligibility as far as that one is concerned, um, however, a lack of historic photos um, precludes me from, from making a definitive um, decision on that because I, I don't know how much it has changed from when the Berries lived there. So in order for something to be eligible associated with a certain person, it needs to look like it did when they lived there. So. So that is, like I said, another one, but you know, maybe someone knows the Berry family or the Historical Society has some other photos that I did not find when I was digging around in your things <laughs> in 2019. Um, and here we have the schoolhouse. Um, a couple of issues with this one. Um, there's still unclear if it was built in 1860 or 1873. Um, I looked at tax records. I looked at I looked at everything I could uh, or that was available. So, but the construction date still remains in question. Um, also, we know this was moved. So then we have the issue of a property being moved again could be potentially eligible as a property type because it's a school. But it also needs to have at least some, it, its setting within the landscape needs to be similar to how it was originally. And because there are few historic photos of it in its place previous, 
it's again hard to make that determination, or at least it was in 2019 at that time from the materials I had. So that is not to say that this could not potentially be eligible um, with a little bit more research. And the final one, um, the Borkston uh, Research Labs. So ultimately, I think, you know, these were the buildings that were historically associated with it. Um, again, we have an issue of not knowing, and I say we, me, in 2019, <laughs> had an issue of not having any historic photographs of some of the buildings to know whether or not it had, if they had changed significantly or not. So um, that one actually wouldn't take a whole lot of extra effort to determine whether or not it's eligible. So that was it for the recommendations. Um, now I'm just gonna go to um, a couple houses that definitely know were lost since 2019. In fact, I think all three of them were this year. Um, I understand the top two were, the top two controlled burn by the fire department. Um, so obviously I did, those were my survey photographs from 2019. And then the bottom one, um, the Catholic rectory, um, which had been moved there admittedly, but still um, also um, just recently torn down. So here's the fun stuff. Um, what, did I, what have I found since 2019? So I have an affinity, affinity for catalog, identification of catalog houses. Um, it's just a thing. And I was flipping through the Better Homes and Gardens, the bottom right page there, and I saw that house and I'm like, and this was just last year, I'm like, I think I surveyed one of those in Fitchburg. So I went through all the photos <laughs> I took in Fitchburg because I couldn't remember where it was. I mean, I knew about where it was, um, but anyway, so I flipped through them all and bingo, there it is, because the top left is, is the photo that I took in, in 2019. So and it's a perfect match down to the stone sheathing, um, the brick, the windows. Um, so I know you're probably not as excited as I was when I found it. Yeah. But anyway, um, I, I don't doubt that there are probably more, uh, not necessarily Better Homes and Gardens, but other, other catalog or magazine. What is that magazine from? Uh, 67, I think. I think. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> and the next one. So I somehow had associated it with um, the Stone Company. I think because I was looking at tax records and such, and I think they owned the larger parcel. I don't know. I'm still a little unclear. This is late breaking information. So um, I am on Facebook and I'm a part of the group of Forgotten Wisconsin. So I'm, you know, reading the Daily Posts back in February or March, something like that. And all of a sudden I stop. I'm like, hey, that's in Fitchburg. <laughs> and if you can read it, um, they said it was built at the U.S. Forest Products Lab in Madison. And it's got about 50 different types of wood in the interior. Um, so the gentleman, I reached out to the gentleman that posted that, and I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> uh, apparently it is owned by a cousin of his. And she's owned it for like 50 years or something. So um, I did try to pump him for a little bit more information. Um, which he said, well, why don't you just stop by sometime at the house or at the building? And I'm like, well, I, I, that'll be a little weird, but okay. So if anybody wants to do that, <laughs> to follow up on that, um, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting story. And I surveyed it. I did not find it potentially eligible, but with that information, it is possible, even though it was moved, um, you know, it depends upon what the story was and why it was built in the first place. Um, again, like I said, this is very new. And in fact, the last correspondence I had with Paul 
um, was yesterday. So, um, but I didn't get any further than at least being able to tell you this much. But so again, once the survey is done, it doesn't mean there isn't more research that can be done. Um, you know, I'll I'll admit, I, you know, again, I have a year to do these things, and you can only find so much. He had an in; it was a relative of his. That's how he knew it. Did anybody else out there know this? Good. <laughs> then I feel better. <laughs> All right. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, I did not go down driveways that were long and so on and so forth. However, I was kind of laughing at myself. And, and I've been in Fitchburg in all the seasons. So leaves up, leaves down, yada, yada, yada. And, and as many times as I drove up and down Lacey Road, because <laughs> my bathroom stop was always here at the library. <laughs> And um, I cannot believe that I didn't even see this property or this house through the trees. Um, so, you know, it's very, you know, you can just that you can see it back there, but it looks like it's still got its clabbered sheathing. It's, um, and again, it's a little bit of farmstead layout. I don't know what's all up there. Someone out here may well know. But moral of the story is this is an example of one of the ones that I'm kind of beating myself up over this one, though, that I didn't even see it. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, there are some that I was not able to inventory based on their locations. What's that? Is that near Eagle School? It is right down, it's right down the road, um, right before the here no, well here. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say Lacey Road and oh, I didn't. I cut off the other. But honestly, it's like a what is it? A half quarter mile <laughs> down the road. Yes. Is there a covered bridge on that property? Can you tell from the photo? I don't know. I don't no, think it's covered. The covered bridge is further down Lacey. That further right. east. Further east. That's the Olson um, house. And that's owned by Olson, Dave Olson. Yeah, Dave Olson, but I don't think it's the house. Oh, this house. is not the Dave. This sits up on the hill right behind yeah. Corey, between oh, yeah, Lacey right. and Corey. Okay. Corey Hill subdivision. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, it's right down the road. So, and now it, the last step. Um, so somebody just put their coat on and leave. That means I got to roll it up here. Um, <laughs> so... This is how you can explore the database yourself if you want to see the photos, if you want to see the information available that I, that I was able to compile. So this is the Wisconsin Historical Society's website. Um, it's www.wisconsinhistory.org. And then this is the, the main page. And then you click on the box that I have circled there, Preserve Your Homes and Properties. And then it'll give you a blank space to write in. So you can put in an address if you're interested in a specific address. Um, you can put in a community. You can, you can put in a variety of things. Um, if you're going to do it by address, I suggest you not put in road or street or because it gets it messes with the database. It doesn't sometimes know how to read it. So give it the least amount of information to start with. So even if you had just done 5225, you would have gotten all of the properties that had a 5225 address in the state that have been surveyed. I can tell you I think it's only like six. So it wouldn't be that terrible to have to go through them all. Um, but you know that and the the road the, for, the road name minus road or street, like I said, is the best way to go. And then you click on the search button there. Whoop. And so there you go. You get a little thumbnail of the property. And the basic information, um, the historic name, the affiliated bank of Jamestown. 
And then here is the actual record, the two on the left. So it gives you the historic name, the current name, where it's located, year built, um, the architect, in this case, I, I knew who it was. Um, and then if there's any bibliographic references, so ultimately there was a, a rendering of the bank when it was built, and that's where I got the architect's name from. Because anything pre-1984, um, there aren't any permits for. So, um, and then the, and I was telling you earlier, um, on the top right, if you have any questions um, when you're using the database, you can email Leah. She's super friendly. Um, and if you have an update, correction, or addition to something, um, she'll be happy to take it. And all you have to do is basically give evidence as to you know, why you think something is wrong or if you have additional information. So um, it's easy to get lost on, on the database, just poking around, looking at stuff. Or if you have a specific interest in, you know, I don't know, Queen, Han Queen Anne houses in the state or that kind of thing, it'll throw up all, all, the, all the examples. So that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, I didn't want to, like I said, it turns out that not many of you actually saw the presentation when I did it in 2019, so that's good. Um, but. I didn't want to bore you either. So that, that's all I got. Um, if you have any questions, I am happy. What? Why Fitchburg? <laughs> um, because Fitchburg went after a, um, a grant to do this. So they are considered a certified local government as far as the historical society is concerned. It means they have a preservation commission and they have ordinances in place. So then they're able to, to go after the, the grant funding um, to do this kind of thing, to hire Nate, someone like sure. me. Did you come across anything referencing the left trail to Fitchburg? That is not something that I recall. So, and again, mostly I'm, I'm standing structures are my primary focus, so. And I do have a copy of the report along uh, if anybody has any questions about a specific property, if it's in there. Um, and again, I will reiterate that just because it's in the back and I surveyed it and don't really have that much information on it doesn't mean that there might not be more information to be found, which was evident with the, the Forest Products Lab place and the Better Homes and Gardens house. So. Let's go, Tracy. Uh, 